The Jew was again being singled out for critical attention throughout the world. His emergence in the financial, political, and social spheres has been so complete and spectacular since the war that his place, power, and purpose in the world are being given a new scrutiny, much of it unfriendly. That's a quote from Henry Ford's The Dearborn Independent, who published The International Jew in 1920. The war he's referring to, of course, is World War I, which became a critical turning point for world events, to say the least. And it was in this atmosphere that hostility towards Jews was accelerating rapidly. Fort's sentiment became orthodoxy among nationalist movements, and his publications on Jews became immensely influential, including in Nazi Germany. Today there is one great man, Ford, who has preserved his independence and is still irritating the Jews. In the wake of the controversy surrounding Kanye West and his comments on Jews, the uproar has been intense. But the punitive actions against Kanye have also had a secondary effect. You may have noticed that many people support Kanye's comments. You may have also noticed that with the backlash, the loss of sponsorships, brand deals, and Adidas dropping Kanye, that some appear to see this as emphasizing or proving Kanye's point. Is the swift backlash proof that Jews are in control of our institutions, our media, banks, perhaps even our government? In other words, is Kanye right? When Ford published The International Jew, Germany was the Weimar Republic. And according to Sarah Ann Gordon in her book Hitler, Germans, and the Jewish Question, Jews were highly active in the theater, the arts, film, and journalism. The prominence of Jews in architecture and within the entire gamut of Weimar culture has been widely recognized. And they were very influential as editors and journalists for leading newspapers. Even in 1881, Jews comprised 9% of all journalists and this percentage increased very substantially by 1933. As anti-Semitism accelerated during the Weimar period, there was an increased public hostility to the ethnic composition of newspaper editorial boards and staff. In other words, a public hostility regarding ethnic composition of media staff appears to have serious historical implications. So today I wanted to take a look at the historical record and investigate anti-Semitism and also answer the question that is on the minds of all people. Who are the people of our elite societies, and how do these societies control the course of world events? There was certainly no bigger player in the global economy throughout the 19th century than that of the House of Rothschild. The Rothschild banking dynasty was founded by Meyer Amschel Rothschild, born in a German-Jewish ghetto in the Holy Roman Empire. The House of Rothschild was founded as a partnership in which Meyer's five sons set up banking firms in the major capitals of Europe, in London, Frankfurt, Vienna, Naples, and Paris. And from 1815 to the First World War, the House of Rothschild was by far the largest bank in the world. But their influence reached beyond just Europe, with Rothschild bankers spanning the globe, gathering intelligence and making deals. This has earned them the title of the most international of all great banking families. The Rothschilds made their fortune through various industries, including insurance, foreign exchange, and personal banking. But their largest clients were governments. The Rothschild banking family would develop a system that helped aid the financialization of the world economy. They became extremely wealthy by financing state debts through fixed interest bonds, which could be traded on international exchanges. This control they had from managing state debts and assets made them extraordinarily powerful in not just economic policy, but major world affairs. So much so, that when a throne was vacant in Europe, the Rothschilds were reportedly asked to help choose who would become the next monarch. Now, many of you are aware that the Rothschilds aren't just famous for their banking exploits. And the story of the Rothschilds doesn't end with them being powerful investment bankers. You may already be aware that the Rothschilds are the subject of many conspiracy theories, and for that reason, the story of the House of Rothschild has become something of a taboo topic. Something that makes people very uncomfortable to discuss, or even to research. You may have seen memes on Facebook like these ones, which claim that the Rothschilds own virtually all the assets of all the governments of the world, or that they have funded both sides of every conflict in modern history. Of course, the uncomfortable fact that makes the Rothschild family a radioactive topic is the fact that Meyer Rothschild and his descendants are Jewish. Now, 
It may be that, and I personally find it reasonable to assume, that not everyone who believes in a Rothschild global conspiracy is anti-Semitic. But what has interested me, as I've utterly buried myself in anti-Semitic literature over the past several weeks, is just how prominent this theory is in anti-Semitic schools of thought. In The Synagogue of Satan by Andrew Carrington Hitchcock, which chronicles a history of, quote, Jewish world domination, the backbone of the storyline from start to finish is the history of the Rothschild family, from the birth of Meyer to the deaths of his children and beyond. Now, many of you may be wondering to yourselves, why is it important or even interesting that the Rothschilds were Jews? Well, to anti-Semites, the Rothschilds weren't evil because of their banking practices, they're evil because they're Jews. And accordingly, Jews by their very nature want to subvert the governments of the world, particularly Western civilization. To the anti-Semite, the Rothschild banking dynasty is the embodiment of an international Jewish conspiracy for world domination. In my reading, I have identified two justifications for Jewish conspiracy theories, one that is religious and one that is biological. Many of you are already aware of the Jews killed Jesus meme, but there are various justifications for anti-Semitism in the Bible that anti-Semites like to invoke. Indeed, the book Synagogue of Satan opens with a Bible verse. Even the name of the book comes from the Bible, in the book of Revelations. The biological explanation is best summarized by Kevin McDonald, arguably the most scholarly of the anti-Semitic thinkers, I'm using the word scholarly very literally there, who believes that Jews are hardwired to subvert the societies they inhabit as part of an evolutionary strategy. According to McDonald, Jews evolved to be collectivist and place their ethnic kinship above all else. White Europeans are the opposite, he argues, because of the harsh environment of the Ice Age. The Nordic peoples evolved in small groups and have a tendency towards social isolation rather than cohesive groups. This theory was originally proposed by Nazi eugenicist Fritz Lenz. McDonald contends that white Europeans have lost a, quote, ethnic war against the Jews as a result of their uniquely Jewish strategy. In the Synagogue of Satan, the author emphasizes this point by including a bedrock of anti-Semitic theory, a document which was so influential it is said to have helped shape Adolf Hitler's worldview. It's called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Shown approvingly in the book as a genuine document, it purports to be the minutes of the First Zionist Congress in 1897, where they allegedly discussed their plan for world domination. I present them in their entirety here, so you will be able to decide for yourself if it is indeed an anti-Semitic hoax, as the Jews claim. As many of you know, the protocols are widely considered to be a complete fraud on account of major plagiarisms and massive borrowing from other earlier texts, namely from a French book called The Dialogue in Hell Between Machiavelli and Montesquieu, a political satire written by Maurice Jolie. This book was published in 1864, decades before the First Zionist Congress. Now, I know many of you wouldn't be satisfied with me saying that I took Wikipedia's word for it that it was a fake, and to be honest, I wasn't satisfied either. So I wasn't an NPC about it, and I pulled up the full translated texts of both and it in fact didn't take me long at all to find multiple examples of borrowing and plagiarism nearly word for word. Looking back on history, it's amazing that I gave the protocols more scrutiny in my little amateur investigation than Hitler, the leaders of the Third Reich, and many in the German and European intelligentsia at the time. What's even more amazing is how this document has remained influential throughout the world to this day. It is, in my opinion, one of the principal examples of the lack of scrutiny, integrity, and thorough research in this bizarre field of study. Even Kevin McDonald, the anti-Semitic academic who believes Jews are biologically subversive, criticizes the tendency of some anti-Semites to develop grand conspiracy theories in which all historical events of major or imagined importance, from the French Revolution to the Trilateral Commission, are linked together in one grand plot and blamed on the Jews. In the Synagogue of Satan and elsewhere, there's nothing that isn't blamed on the Jews. In the book, the Rothschilds created the Illuminati, which is based on the teachings of the Talmud. The secret society would be headed by Adam Weishaupt, who was Jewish. The Rothschilds set up the first national bank in the U.S. with the help of Alexander Hamilton, who was a Jewish Rothschild agent. The Rothschilds ordered Britain to go to war with America, causing the War of 1812, 
They also caused the Napoleonic Wars and the Opium Wars to protect the opium trade, which they also controlled. They funded Karl Marx and Friedrich Nietzsche, and subsequently the Frankfurt School, creating Nietzscheanism, which became Nazism. The Rothschilds funded communism because communism was a Jewish plan for state capitalism. Rothschilds would start the American Civil War, with the southern states attacking the north because of, quote, Rothschild agents and their brainwashed followers. They killed Lincoln, who was Jewish. That's why he created big government. He would be killed by John Wilkes Booth, who was also a Jew. And it wasn't just Lincoln who was secretly Jewish, but also the Rockefellers, Fidel Castro, Winston Churchill, Joseph Stalin, and Franklin Roosevelt, whose real name is Rosenfeld. <laughs> Also Rupert Murdoch, David Cameron, and George Bush, among others. Of course, in Hitchcock's history, as well as Mel Gibson's, the Jews were responsible for World War I and II. But prior to the First World War, the Rothschilds were actually seriously engaged in diplomacy with the major powers in order to avoid war. Alfred Rothschild even sent this letter to a German diplomat. I hope and pray with my whole heart that no serious war may result. I have done everything possible over such a long period of years and I feel now that you do not fully appreciate the great advantage of a genuine understanding with England. Rather than profiting from the war, like they did from the Battle of Waterloo, when they sold and then rebought English bonds, World War I was a disaster for the family's wealth. The London House would lose so much of its money that it fell from the largest to the second largest bank by 1915, and then third by 1918. Rather than aiding their quest for global domination, the Rothschilds' international financial system was ruined. The Vienna and the London and French houses would sever ties for good. And this is nothing compared to New York taking London's place as the world's economic capital. Before World War I, the Rothschilds practically had a monopoly on state finance, but it was now J.P. Morgan who filled that role. Simply put, World War I would be the end of the Rothschild reign. But in Hitchcock's book, money was not the only motivation. It was also a manifestation of Jewish ritualistic slaughter of Christians. In one of the most alarming and frightening parts of the book, Hitchcock describes this alleged practice. Jewish ritual murder generally consists of a ceremony presided over by a rabbi, in which a Christian child is crucified. They are tortured, their blood drained whilst they are still alive, and either drunk or placed into ceremonial unleavened bread for the Jews to consume on their holy days. But they are keener to engineer large-scale wars in which the blood of millions of Christians is on their hands, rather than the odd one or two in their satanic ceremonies. Before reading this book, I figured that this ritual murder theory was something of a 4chan meme, but to read it with this serious cadence was deeply disturbing. Following World War I, Henry Ford's Dearborn Independent would publish The International Jew, in which he claims that Jews had taken control and dominated the political and financial systems, becoming America's all-powerful and insidious elite. But is this true? Well, there's a good thing that an exhaustive study was conducted on this subject by C. Wright Mills of Columbia University. Mills would publish a book on his findings in 1956 called The Power Elite. Mills argues that the power elite constitutes the men that direct the military establishment, run the big corporations, and run the machinery of the state. These constitute the means of power, also known as the Big Three. The power elite is composed of men, in positions to make decisions having major consequences. The decisions that they make and fail to make carry more consequences for more people than has ever been the case in the world history of mankind. Rather than the Rothschilds or Judaism controlling world events, Mills contends that no family is as powerful as the corporation and no church is as powerful as the military establishment. Mills argues that the American elite is less a collection of persons than of corporate entities, and from the evidence he presents, it's clear who's really in charge. In April of 1953, Secretary of the Interior Douglas McKay would let slip to his friends in the Chamber of Commerce that, we're here in the saddle as an administration representing business and industry. What Mills identifies as the corporate elite, the chief executives comprising the corporate rich, are the ones who control the economy. Their private decisions determine the size and shape of the national economy, the level of employment, the purchasing power of the consumer, the prices that are advertised, the investments that are channeled. Not Wall Street financiers or bankers, but large owners and executives and their self-financing corporations hold the keys of economic power. And who are the corporate elite? 
When Mills published his book, there had only been roughly three generations since the creation of the current corporation at the end of the 19th century. So his data comprises three groups from 1900, 1925, and 1950. The result? At the top of the 1900 group was John D. Rockefeller with a billion dollars. And in 1925 was Henry Ford I with his billion. And in 1950, H.L. Hunt was worth one to two billion dollars. At the time, those men were the richest of the rich Americans. In fact, they were the only billionaires in which biographers knew of at the time. Typical executives are Protestant, white, and American-born, and more likely to be Episcopalians or Presbyterians than Baptists or Methodists. The Jews and Catholics among them are fewer than among the population at large. Jews would become slightly more represented as time went on, as was documented in The Outsiders, Jews in Corporate America, written by Abraham Corman and published in 1988. He conducted a three-year-long investigation, scouring executive rosters looking for Jewish family names, then conducting interviews and searching reference books. At the time the book was published, over 4% of the senior executives of Fortune 500 companies were Jewish. This is roughly in line with the estimate from an investigation that I conducted of the chief executives of the 100 largest companies by revenue in the world. Using some of the same methods as Corman, such as looking for Jewish family names and searching reference material. Fascists on the internet have a saying, to seek the cause of chaos and strife, go to the category early life. So I did, but I wasn't satisfied with just looking there. I did my due diligence and looked for interviews, oral and written statements. Such as CEO of Amerisource Bergen, Stephen H. Collis. His early life section doesn't list his religion, but I found a transcript of an interview from the Economic Club of Washington, D.C., where Collis reveals that he's Jewish. It is my estimate that out of 100 chief executives of the top 100 corporations of the world, five are indeed Jewish. And out of 100 chairs of the boards of directors for the top 100 corporations, five are Jewish. Certainly an overrepresentation, but far from dominating the corporate world by any stretch of the imagination. But is overrepresentation a manifestation of a conspiracy? Maybe the explanation isn't mysterious at all. In David A. Hollinger's Rich, Powerful, and Smart, he argues that Jewish overrepresentation should be explained instead of avoided or mystified. By almost any index, Jews are demographically overrepresented among the wealthiest, the most politically powerful, and the most intellectually accomplished of Americans. Jewish success is such an inescapable fact that it invites emphasis and explanation. The failure to pursue this question implicitly fuels largely unexpressed speculations. Of course, from the outset, Hollinger explains, Jews had a high literacy rate sustained by rabbinical Judaism. But Jews also held a special economic position as an outsider group. They provided a range of services of which Christians and agricultural peoples in Europe were conflicted, including lending money, especially with interest. Of course, as Hollinger notes, historians of European Judaism have explained all this to us a million times, and it's widely known. In fact, Jews had such an established position with regard to money lending in Europe that in the original Magna Carta, the laws governing money lending doesn't refer to bankers, but Jews. Jews subsequently developed to a higher degree than other European groups the skills on which the modernization process most depended. Calculation, language fluency, record keeping, close attention to detail, etc. All skills that are highly relevant to this day. Abraham Corman, author of The Outsiders, believes that despite the overrepresentation of Jews in corporate executive positions, they are in fact underrepresented given their education. With an average of over 13 years of schooling, Jews are the most highly educated of all the world's major religions. In fact, among all Jewish adults aged 25 and up, nearly all of them have primary education and well over half have post-secondary degrees. Despite these advantages, Jews have not managed to dominate the corporate seat of power. The corporate rich are a creation of the state who granted the right to private property, enshrining the right of the corporation into law, and with the protection of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause, effectively granting corporations personhood, the corporation has only gotten more powerful since, and never less. It's these corporations, I'd argue, that govern our world and influence policy. During World War II, another kind of economy was developed, when the military establishment merged with that of the corporate economy. Naturally, the predictable outcome of this is a permanent war economy. War is, of course, the health of the corporate economy. The power elite has been shaped by the coincidence of interests between those who control the major means of production and those who control the newly enlarged means of violence. 
From the decline of the professional politician and the rise to explicit political command of the corporate chieftains and the professional warlords. Thanks for watching, guys. Be sure to um, check the description for Patreon. Please support me there. I don't know if I'm even going to try to monetize this video because it's, it's pretty yikesy. But let me know what you think, guys. Love you. Stay safe.